This week, we're going to do Unit 2, Development and Care During Pregnancy. The first thing we're going to talk about is the placenta. kind of seems like an odd place to begin, but the placenta is very important in the development of a healthy baby. The placenta. The function of the placenta is going to be dependent upon maternal circulation, the mother's blood pressure, the condition of the mother's vascular system, maternal position, and uterine contractions are all going to affect the function of the placenta. For the function of the placenta. In the first functions that we're going to talk about is the placenta acts as an endocrine gland. The placenta makes a number of hormones that are necessary to sustain pregnancy and develop a healthy newborn. The first hormone that we're going to talk about is human chorionic gonadotropin. Human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG, is initially made by the trophoblast. Its responsibility is to maintain the corpus luteum early in pregnancy. And also, this hormone is the basic hormone that we use to test for pregnancy. Um, HCG is going to be increased in multiple pregnancies. HCG is going to peak in its amount at about 60 to 70 days gestation. After that, it decreases and uh, continues to go down until about four months of gestation. Estrogen is the next major hormone uh, that the placenta makes. It is also increased in multiple pregnancies. Estrogen is very important in maintaining the pregnancy. And we're going to find that circulating estriol increases during pregnancy. Estriol is excreted in the urine. We can use cereal serum, that is, estrogens found in the blood, or urinary estriols to use as indicators of fetal well-being. Estrogen should continue to increase throughout pregnancy and should not drop. If we find that estriol levels are decreasing, it may indicate that there's problems developing for the fetus. <clears throat> now, what does estrogen do for us? Well, first of all, estrogen causes the enlargement of the uterus. It increases blood supply. It causes the enlargement of the breasts and the alveoli. It increases fat deposits throughout the whole body. It increases the elasticity of connective tissue. That is, it relaxes joints and pelvic ligaments. And this is going to be very, very important when the woman finally goes into labor because relaxed joints and pelvic ligaments are going to add a little bit more wiggle room for the fetus as it goes through the birth canal. It is also responsible for increasing the size of the cervix and it softens the cervix. Estrogen is also responsible for sodium and water retention. Estrogen increases the coagulability of the blood, and it also decreases the fibrolinic activity. Now, this is a really good thing for a pregnant woman, because when she goes through labor and delivers the baby, uh, the increased coagulability and decreased fibrolinic activity allow her to clot her blood and not be as likely to hemorrhage. On the other hand, um, they, this also predisposes the pregnant woman to blood clots or thrombophobitis. Estrogen is also responsible for vascular changes. One such one is telangiectasis or spider nevi. These are little vascular uh, changes that you can see on the skin, and you'll know that they're spider nevi because when you put pressure on them, they'll disappear. Another uh, thing that estrogen does is it causes palmar erythema. In other words, some of your pregnant women will look like they have red palms. Estrogen increases the production of melanin-stimulating hormone. And melanin-stimulating hormone is responsible for those brownish discolorations that occur on different parts of the body of the pregnant woman. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Now, another hormone of pregnancy is progesterone. And some of the effects of progesterone are that it, in, uh, it increases throughout pregnancy. It decreases the contractility of the uterus. That's a good thing because we don't want the woman going into labor until it's time. Progesterone also promotes the development of the secretory portions of the breast. It decreases gastric motility and it causes the sphincters to relax. This is because progesterone acts on smooth muscle to cause it to relax. Now, by decreasing gastric motility and having the sphincters in the GI tract relax, 
This leads to some of those discomforts. Number one, constipation. Peristalsis is decreased, so the woman is prone to constipation. The sphincters are relaxed, so the woman is more likely to experience heartburn. Progesterone increases sodium excretion, and it increases the sensitivity of the respiratory center to carbon dioxide. Therefore, the respiratory rate in the pregnant woman is going to be increased. Progesterone, as I have already said, decreases the tone of smooth muscle, leading to constipation, um, and it also really uh, relaxes the smooth muscle of the bladder and the ureters. When this happens, this can lead to bladder distension, um, urinary stasis, and predisposes the woman to having urinary tract infections. Progesterone also decreases the vascular tone throughout the body because the blood vessels are lined with smooth muscle. This relaxed tone can lead to venous distension, edema, and varicosities. Now these may be varicosities of the legs, or you may find the varicosities are in the form of hemorrhoids. The next hormone that we're going to talk about is human chorionic somatotropin, and it should be HCS or you can also call it human placental lactogen, HPL. This hormone is responsible for increases in growth of the mother and the fetus. It makes glucose available to the fetus to use and to grow. HPL also increases blood glucose levels. This leads to an increased production of insulin. Now, in women who are unable to meet the increased demands to make insulin, we may find that the woman experiences gestational diabetes. Okay. HPL, human placental lactogen, and think of lactogen like milk, prepares the breast for lactation. HPL also increases protein synthesis, and protein synthesis is needed for growth. Other function of the placenta, other than those of being an endocrine gland, include metabolic, respiratory, and renal functions for the fetus. The placenta also has immunologic functions and can act as a protective barrier against some drugs and microorganisms. And I want you to stress the some. Many, many drugs and microorganisms cross readily through the placenta. The next thing that we need to talk about is placental transfer. And it's important to remember when we're talking about placental transfer that during the second and third trimesters, only one cell separates maternal and fetal circulation. Because of that, it is what we call a partial or a semi-permeable membrane. It is a partial barrier. Major mechanisms of placental transfer are as follows. The first is diffusion. By diffusion, oxygen, carbon dioxide, anesthetic gases, water, electrolytes, and other things with a very low molecular weight pass across the maternal circulation to the fetal circulation. You probably remember that from your chemistry class. The next major mechanism of placental transfer is active transfer. Active transfer often occurs by enzyme action. This includes larger molecules and such things as glucose, amino acids, and iron. These are substances that have a higher molecular weight than the ones that had passed through by diffusion. The third mechanism is pinocytosis. Boy, I just really love that word. Pinocytosis is transfer of larger particles um, across the membrane, and these include fats. And if you think of it, fats are very, very large molecules. The fourth and last mechanism of placental transfer is leakage. Now remember, I said during the second and third trimester, there's only one cell separating maternal and fetal circulation. And so leakage is caused by small defects in the surface of where that cell is. And it allows for a slight mixing of maternal and fetal blood cells and plasma. This is really important because when we're talking about our mothers who are Rh negative, and if they're carrying an Rh positive fetus, if any of that fetus's Rh positive blood happens to cross over to the mother via leakage, then she may begin to make antibodies against the fetal blood. For this reason, 
we give mothers who are Rh negative um, Rogam at about the 28th week of pregnancy. And if you remember, Rogam is going to prevent the mother from making antibodies against the fetus's blood. Okay, now we're going to talk about anatomic and physiologic changes during pregnancy. First, we're going to talk about the reproductive system. The ovaries <coughs> are marked by anovulation. In other words, the woman does not ovulate while she is pregnant. The uterus also changes greatly. It enlarges into a thin walled sac from a very small, thick walled sac. At the same time, the uterus also increases its vascularity and the actual cells within the uterus hypertrophy and also we have hyperplasia, meaning that more of them are formed. Other reproductive changes that we can see with the uterus are Hager sign. Hager sign is a softening of the lower uterine segment. And this is something that we can use to help us date the pregnancy of the woman because it is seen between the second and third months of pregnancy. The position of the uterus also changes during pregnancy. At around 12 weeks, gestation is going to rise out of the pelvis. Now, this rising out of the pelvis is something that occurs pretty much right on time at 12 weeks. So the physician or midwife can use that as a landmark to help them date how long, far along an individual pregnancy is. Another thing that we see uh, with the uterus throughout pregnancy are Braxton Hicks contractions. These are irregular, painless contractions that occur throughout pregnancy. They become more frequent during the third trimester. Now it's these Braxton Hicks contractions that um, even though they're painless throughout the, most of the pregnancy, as we approach term, sometimes they become painful and sometimes women mistake these Braxton Hicks contractions as true labor contractions. And it is one reason that may bring a woman into the hospital in false labor. We'll talk more about that later also. Now, there are oscillatory changes that occur over the uterus during pregnancy. And some of the sounds that you can hear via auscultation would be the phonic suffle. This is the sound of the fetal blood in the umbilical cord. And when you listen to the uterus, and if you hear the phonic suffle, you'll find that it kind of makes a swoosh noise, but that it also matches the fetal heart rate. The uterine suffle is also a sound that you can hear by auscultating the uterus, and it's the sound of the blood going through the placenta. Again, you'll hear sort of a swoosh swoosh sound and you'll find that it matches the mom's heart rate. So if ever you're auscultating the uterus and you hear sort of a slow swoosh swoosh noise and let's say it's about 86 beats per minute instead of panicking and going oh my goodness the baby's heart rate is only about half of what it should be you'll say gee maybe I should take the mother's pulse and see if this sound I'm hearing matches it. If it does then you're listening to the mother's heart rate, not the baby's. <clears throat> fetal heart tones are another thing that you can hear via auscultation. Fetal heart tones can be first heard with a fetoscope at about 18 to 20 weeks. And you can use that as an indicator of how long, far along the pregnancy is. The heart tones are also first heard with an ultrasonic Doppler at about 10 to 12 weeks gestation. Now, if a woman's in the office and getting the fetal heart rate checked, and she thinks she's maybe 11 weeks pregnant, but you can't find the fetal heart rate, well, maybe she's possibly just nine or 10 weeks gestation. And at that time, it's normal not to be able to hear them. So don't panic and don't let your mom panic either. Um, they'll usually have her come back in a week or two and listen again, and usually the heart rate will be there. Other changes that occur will be in the cervix. Now remember, the cervix is the lower end of the uterus. The endocervical glands are going to begin secreting a thick mucus plug. This is the mucus plug that is expelled from the cervical canal when dilation begins. The cervix is also going to be con become congested. There's going to be increased vascular congestion. This is going to cause a softening and also a kind of a bluish purple discoloration. It's really quite pretty if you can ever see it, and if you saw it, you'd recognize it right away. 
This bluish purple discoloration is called Chadwick's sign and it becomes apparent at about eight weeks of gestation. Now it's important to have the softening of the cervix throughout pregnancy because it's going to allow for the cervix to dilate and efface more readily when the woman finally goes into labor. Now the actual softening of the cervix is called Goodell's sign and that occurs at about the six week gestation. Vaginal changes also occur during pregnancy. First we're going to have mu mucosal color changes. Those again are going to be that sort of bluish purple discoloration that we saw with the cervix. Um, there is going to be an increase in the vascularity and an increase in um, sensitivity. During this time the vaginal secretions also increase in amount and they're going to be kind of whitish and they're going to be acidic. Um, the vagina is going to become a glycogen rich environment and unfortunately this environment is very favorable to candida albicans growth. That's your yeast infection. Now yeast infections women have a whitish discharge also. You're going to say well how can I tell the difference between the normal whitish discharge and the yeast infection which is also a whitish discharge. Well the yeast infection usually is more of a curdy type of consistency whereas the whitish discharge that's normal is more of a thin discharge. Also when you have a yeast infection it causes considerable itching in the perineal area. Um, the breasts have to um, undergo many changes during pregnancy. Number one they're going to increase in size and many, many women really like this. They like to have a larger breast size than usual. The nipples are going to become more pronounced. The areolar is going to become darker in color. Now the areolar is the darkened part that goes around the nipple on the breasts. The breasts are going to have increased vascularity and sometimes this increased vascularity can actually be seen through the skin on the breasts and for some women it's kind of disconcerting to be able to see the blood vessels and veins through their breast tissue. Uh, assure them that it is a normal change and it's the body's way of helping to get ready for breastfeeding following delivery. Colostrum may appear. Remember that is the precursor to breast milk that women have following delivery. Uh, colostrum may appear in the last few weeks of pregnancy. It's more likely to appear in those women who have had a baby before. The cardiovascular system undergoes many changes. Perhaps one of the most important changes is that the circulating blood volume is going to increase by 40 to 50 percent which is about 1500 mLs. Just think of how much 1500 mLs is. Think of one of those big 1000 cc IV bags and then half of another one. Quite a bit of fluid to add to the body. Now this increase in blood volume is going to peak at about 30 to 32 weeks gestation. This increased blood volume is necessary for several reasons. We have a lot more parts to the body to perfuse plus a placenta. Also after delivery having an increased blood volume sort of semi protects the woman who loses a lot of blood. Since she has extra blood she can lose more blood volume without showing clinical changes of shock or of just feeling faint. Now another important thing with this to remember is that your women who have cardiac problems for example um, perhaps as they go through pregnancy and adding the extra blood volume their heart may not be able to handle the workload and so as they approach 30 to 32 weeks they're at increased risk for experiencing cardiac decompensation which we also call congestive heart failure. During um, pregnancy the total red blood cell volume is going to increase. Unfortunately the increase in red blood cells does not keep pace with the increase in the blood volume or the plasma. Because of this we may see that the woman uh, experiences physiologic anemia. Okay, And if you think about that her hematocrit is going to be low because the portion of the fluid part of the blood is greater in proportion to the solid part of the blood or the red blood cells. So she becomes anemic and we can call that physiologic anemia of pregnancy. The heart size is going to increase and that increases because after all it's pumping 
extra blood volume, 1,500 cc's, and so it increases in size uh, as the muscle grows. The heart is also going to be elevated up and to the left, and that's because as the uterus grows, it's going to press on the diaphragm and push the heart up and over to one side to make room for that growing uterus. The pulse rate may increase from 15 to 20 beats per minute. Blood pressure should remain stable. If anything, it should decrease slightly during pregnancy. A blood pressure that goes up is always abnormal. And if you remember from our first year, that that is associated with gestational hypertension. And we'll talk more about that later when we get into problems of pregnancy. Iron requirements are increased. Now this makes sense because remember we just said that red blood cell formation is increased. And we know that iron is necessary to make hemoglobin that's with the red blood cells. Cardiac output is also going to increase. It's going to increase by 30% by the end of the second semester. And that's due to the increased blood volume. There is also an increased tendency for the blood to coagulate due to the decreased fibrolytic activity. That's going to predispose the woman once again to thrombophobitis. The woman may experience supine hypotension, which is also called vena cava syndrome. That's when she lays on her back and the pressure of the uterus and the baby press against the vena cava, preventing blood from returning to the heart and therefore going out to the other parts of the body. White blood cells are going to be increased. The renal system. Women experience a lot of urinary frequency during the first and third trimesters. This is due to the pressure of the enlarging uterus. Remember that during the first trimester, the uterus stays within the pelvis, and as it grows, it pr presses against the bladder. Then it's going to rise out of the pelvis at the 12th week, which is the beginning of the second trimester. So urinary frequency is sort of eliminated at that point. Now, by the time we get to the third trimester, this baby and uterus and placenta are getting really, really big. And once again, they're putting pressure on the urinary bladder, causing urinary frequency. At this time, because of smooth muscle relaxation, we have decreased bladder tone. Uh, we also have an increase in renal plasma flow. Now, because of the increase in renal plasma flow, we have an increase in the glomerular filtration rate. Because of the increase in the glomerular filtration rate, we may find that small, very small, like trace amounts of glucose may spill into the urine. Remember, if you're seeing more than a trace amount, and it's happening every time that you check her urine, then you probably need to look into that further and see if it's caused by gestational diabetes. Sometimes uh, we also see proteinuria in the urine. You need to remember that proteinuria is never normal. It could be due to a urinary tract infection, or perhaps the woman is developing preeclampsia. So anytime you find proteinuria in the urine, you need to follow up on that finding. For the skin, there are many, many changes that occur. The big one is we have hyperpigmentation. Now, hyperpigmentation is from that melanin-stimulating hormone that had increased through the effects of estrogen on it. And some of the hyperpigmentation you may see are alinea negra. That's a dark line that runs from the belly button all the way down to the um, pubic area. We may also see colosma. Colosma is the mask of pregnancy. When you say the mask of pregnancy, woo, that sounds sort of kind of almost horrifying. Well, for some women, they feel like it is. Um, the mask of pregnancy is brown blotches that tend to go across the cheeks on the side of the face. Now, many times women will say, well, gee whiz, is this ever going to go away? I feel like I don't look like myself. I have blotchy brown spots on my skin. Well, usually Colosma will fade, but usually it doesn't go away 100%. So you don't want to promise the woman that, gee whiz, sure, once you're done, your skin will go back exactly how it was because it won't. We already talked about telagectitis nevi, which are the spider varicosities, and you'll see like little spider webby type red veins on the skin and again that the woman will experience Palmer erythema. Another thing that um, I didn't list here but that you all probably know about 
our stretch marks, those dreaded stretch marks. Uh, they, during pregnancy, as the uterus grows, they become apparent and they usually look like red lines. Again, uh, the woman will, might ask you, are these ever going to go away? Well, after the woman delivers the baby, they do fade and they tend to go down to a silvery sort of look rather than a red look, but they don't go away 100%. It's just one of those things that happens during pregnancy. Uh, the musculoskeletal system is also undergoing changes. We've already talked about pelvic joint relaxation. Also with the growing uterus off the uh, anterior aspect of the woman, it's going to put a lot of weight off of her anterior side and so it's going to lead to postural changes. <clears throat> These postural changes and the joint relaxation can wind up leading to backache. Now if women who are pregnant complain of a lot of backache during pregnancy, one thing you can tell them to do is to do pelvic tilt exercises or if they get down on the floor on their hands and knees and arch their back like a kitty cat and that's usually a lot easier to teach than trying to teach them to do a pelvic tilt up against the wall <clears throat> that that can um, help relieve some of the back pain. The next system that undergoes many changes is the gastrointestinal system. Nausea and vomiting may be present. This is the dreaded morning sickness. Remember, morning sickness usually occurs if it's going to occur during the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, and it's thought that this might be due to increased amounts of AC or HCG, that human chorionic gonadotropin. Now, I know they call this morning sickness. Uh, however, I want you to remember that morning sickness does not always just occur during the morning. It can occur morning, afternoon, night, middle of the night. Um, and there are things that we can do about it. If a woman's having morning sickness and she's waking up nauseated, we can have her keep dry crackers or toast by the bedside and eat those before she gets up. She can eat small frequent meals and that helps considerably. Now women also experience alterations in their taste and smell. This is probably what's responsible for some of those cravings that women have for different types of food while they're pregnant. We've already mentioned how constipation is a change and this is due to decreased GI motility and pressure of the uterus. Also, it could also be compounded by decreased activity late in pregnancy. Heartburn also occurs. Uh, one thing that we can do with heartburn is to recommend that women eat small frequent meals and that they don't eat or drink anything near bedtime. Now, even water. Uh, women who drink water before they uh, lay down sometimes are going to find that they have terrible heartburn. And it's simply that the water has not passed on through the GI system. They lay down, water's nice and thin, it goes up through the relaxed sphincters after, of course, it's mixed with, the a mixed with the acids in the stomach and can cause quite a bit of heartburn. The woman can also um, sort of prop herself up in bed at night and gravity will help prevent some of the heartburn. Another thing that happens because of estrogen is the gum tissue may become swollen and bleed easily. Now, during pregnancy, it's important that women know that they can still see their dentist and have dental work done. They just need to let the dentist know that they're pregnant. Tylism or acceptance of salivation is another change that pregnant women experience. Another thing is pica. Hmm. Now, pica is kind of a strange thing, and pica is the eating of non-nutritive food substances. What are some of the things that people eat? Well, if you go down south, kind of in the mountainy areas or in the Piedmont, you know, the big hills, uh, in the past, many women down there, for whatever reasons, like in Georgia, would eat the Georgia red clay. And you think, well, why would they eat clay? They just have a yen or a yearn from it, and it might be culturally derived. It could be from other things. We don't really know for positive. The important thing to note is that if people are eating clay, then they're going to fill up and they're not going to want to eat food that's healthy for them. Um, another thing that uh, people have done in the past is um, eat laundry starch. Um, now laundry starch really doesn't have any nutrients in it either. So we want to discourage that. If you have a woman who is experiencing pica and eating 
paper or clay or starch or who knows what. You have to approach it very sensitive, um, sensitively. Uh, women are kind of embarrassed, you know, so if you tell them, gee, why are you doing that? Uh, they're going to feel embarrassed and they may not want to come back and see you again. So instead, it's better to approach it from a health standpoint and say, you know, how you're concerned about eating clay because perhaps it's keeping them from eating food substances that would be of more benefit to them and their baby. And then again, listen to why they say they are eating it. The next big topic we're going to talk about is the assessment of fetal well-being. And throughout pregnancy, we want to make sure that our babies are growing and doing well in utero. The first major assessment of fetal well-being we can do is an ultrasound. Now, ultrasounds can be used for a whole variety of different reasons, and one of them is we can use it for an early identification of a pregnancy. Very early in pregnancy with an ultrasound, you can see that there's a growing embryo and then a fetus there. We can use ultrasound to ID multiple pregnancies. We can look and if we think that perhaps we've heard more than one heartbeat, we can use an ultrasound to find is there one baby in there, two, three, four, seven, however many. You know, you can actually count the babies on the ultrasound. We can use ultrasound to do measurements to identify gestational age and to help identify interuterine growth retardation. Now, if ultrasound is done very early in pregnancy, say at 10 to 12 weeks, you can do what is called a crown rump measurement from the ultrasound. That is a very good way of dating the pregnancy. And early in pregnancy, it is very, very accurate. So if you get an ultrasound at 10 to 12 weeks, you can pretty much identify how many weeks gestation that baby is. After all, there's not a whole lot of difference in size between those 10-week-old fetuses. Um, now, later in pregnancy, we run into problems. If the very first ultrasound isn't done until someone is 32, 33 weeks pregnant, uh, it becomes more problematic. You can still identify how many weeks along the baby is, but you might need to do more than one measurement and compare them to see how much growth has taken place. If you know um, that a woman is 36 weeks gestation because you did an earlier ultrasound, but the baby that you see on ultrasound is only the size of a 32-week gestation, then you can say, hmm, this baby's experiencing intrauterine growth retardation. There's something wrong here. Maybe the placenta is not perfusing the baby the way it should. And that can help the physician make a decision. Would this baby be better off continuing to grow on the inside of the mother? Or are we having a failure of the placenta where perhaps we should deliver her early, or him early, the baby, and um, <clears throat> see if we can help the baby grow better on the outside? We can also use ultrasound to detect anomalies in the baby. Ultrasounds can also be used to detect polyhydramnios, which is too much amniotic fluid, or oligodramnios, which is too little amniotic fluid. Both of those conditions are associated with less than the best outcome. We can use the ultrasound to identify the location of the placenta. Is the placenta located where it should be, in the upper portion of the uterus, or is it located covering the cervix? If it is covering the cervix, then we have a problem because that would be a placenta previa. And we would know that our mother is most likely going to have a cesarean delivery and that she is at risk for hemorrhage. We can use an ultrasound to observe the fetal heartbeat and fetal breathing movements. We can determine the fetal position and presentation from the ultrasound. We can determine is the mother uh, going to have a baby who's in a breech position. If you remember, for a butt first position. If the baby is in that position, or I should say in that presentation, we are going to know that we are going to need to deliver that mother by cesarean section, unless it would happen to turn to a head down presentation. So the ultrasound can give us a lot of good ideas and good things to help us determine is the baby doing well? 
how are we going to have to deliver this baby? <clears throat> okay, now we're going to talk about gestational age assessment. The first way that we can do gestational age assessment is by using Nagel's rule. And I'm going to have the expectation that you all remember how to use Na Nagel's rule to determine the due date for a woman or that you can look it up in your text. The next measure of gestational age is fetal movement. Now the first fetal movement is called quickening and that is generally speaking felt initially at 16 to 22 weeks. If a mother feels movement, you can pretty much say, if it's the first movement, that her baby is 16 to 20 weeks of gestation. In fact, usually it's right around 20 weeks. Another way that thing that can help us determine gestational age are when we hear the fetal heart sounds. Remember that the fetal heart sounds are first detected at 10 to 12 weeks gestation with an ultrasonic Doppler. So if you have a woman who comes in for her first visit and you can hear the fetal heart tones, you can be fairly certain that that baby is 10 to, week, 10 to 12 weeks gestation or further along. If you could hear the fetal heart rate with a fetoscope, then you would know that the baby is at least 16 to 20 weeks along in gestation. Now the next thing are the cr crown rump measurements and uh, we already mentioned those that they can be done on an early pregnancy uh, using an ultrasound. Uh, another thing that we can measure on ultrasound would be the biparietal diameter and we can do that after 12 to 13 weeks gestation. The biparietal diameter, that's the diameter through the parietal bones of the skull. Um, Another way that we can determine gestational age is by measuring the fundal height. It's important to know that the fundal height, though, it can be very difficult to interpret. Um, the fundal height measurement, which is measuring from the top of the uterus to the top of the symphysis pubis with measuring tape, can be affected by maternal weight. A mother who is very obese is going to have a greater fundal height for the number of weeks gestation simply because she has more adipotis, adipose tissue deposited in her abdomen. Uh, if the woman has polyhydramnios, too much amniotic fluid, that's also going to make the uterus appear larger in size than the actual weeks of gestation. Multiple gestation does the same type of thing. And towards term, fetus, um, the size of the fetus can make a huge difference. If you have a nine pound fetus, the fundal height is going to be higher than if you have a baby that is only six pounds within the uterus. Another thing that can really um, goof up a fundal height is the person who's actually doing the measuring. One person to another probably have slight differences in how they measure. Uh, you can use McDonald's rule along with fundal height to determine the week's gestation. Now, we just talked about how we can check for gestational age. Now we're going to talk about prenatal monitoring of fetal status. In other words, is this baby doing well on the inside or not? The first thing that we can do is an amniocentesis. Amniocentesis can be performed after the 14th week of gestation. Uh, that's when there is enough fluid within the uterus and the uterus has moved out of the abdominal cavity so that it's in such a position that we can actually place an abdomen through or a needle through the mother's abdomen and collect some amniotic fluid. An amniocentesis is preceded by an ultrasound. We do the ultrasound because we need to make sure where the fetus is, where is the placenta, and where are there pockets of fluid. We don't want to go in with a long needle just haphazardly and blind. So they're going to look on the ultrasound and then see if they can figure out a way where they can avoid the placenta. Sometimes we can't, but we don't like going through the placenta because we could hit a blood vessel and cause bleeding. <clears throat> We're going to look and see, see where there's a pocket of fluid so that once we get the needle into the uterus, there's actually some fluid to suck up. And of course, we want to miss the fetus and the umbilical cord. Uh, it would really be quite a tragedy to put the needle right through the baby 
instead of into just a pocket of fluid. So we do an ultrasound first to determine where we should go. Now, with amniocentesis, there are complications that can occur with this. And one is maternal hemorrhage. We could hit a maternal blood vessel and she could bleed. Uh, another problem is infection. After all, we can't totally sterilize the skin. Of course, we're going to clean it with betadine and disinfect it. But as that needle goes through the abdomen, we could carry microorganisms all the way into the uterus. We could cause preterm labor. When we put a needle into the uterus, it's sort of irritating to the uterus, and it may cause the uterus to begin to contract. If we hit the fetus, we could cause the baby to hemorrhage. And we can um, get an amnionitis, which is an infection or an inflammation of the amnion that is surrounding the baby in utero. <clears throat> now, once we get our amniotic fluid, we can do an amniotic fluid assessment. There's a lot of things we can or learn from amniotic fluid. One is that we can use it prenatally to diagnose chromosomal disorders, genetic disorders, and neural tube defects. Now, when we're using an amniocentesis to determine these things, we usually like to do it as early as we can during the pregnancy. Uh, remember, it has to be 14 weeks or greater. Uh, let's say we have a mother who has the history of having delivered <clears throat> a baby with Down syndrome before. We know that that is trisomy 21, and so there's an extra chromosome there. She may want to know, is she carrying another baby with Down syndrome? They can actually take the amniotic fluid and from the fluid determine whether or not the chromosomes are normal. Um, now, the problem with this is that the amniotic fluid assessment cannot recognize all problems that the baby could have. So even though you can rule out problems that are of a genetic or chromosome nature, there are many things that we just won't see. And so they could still have a baby who winds up being born with a defect. Um, we can also use amniotic fluid assessment to diagnose and evaluate isoimmune disease. Remember, isoimmune disease is, takes place when the mother is Rh negative and the baby is Rh positive. The mother has made antibodies against the baby. If she has that, those antibodies will break down the baby's blood. And from the amniocentesis, we can determine if that's occurring and how um, severe it is, and therefore know whether or not we have to treat the baby in utero. <clears throat> now, we can also do gestational age assessment from the amniotic fluid. And usually, when we're doing a gestational age assessment, it's later in pregnancy. We're trying to determine, is this baby mature enough to deliver? Perhaps the mother's a diabetic. Perhaps she has gestational hypertension. And we would like to deliver the baby as soon as possible so then the mother can begin to get well. Or we might be concerned that the baby isn't growing that well in utero and we'd rather have the baby on the outside. However, we would like the baby to have mature lungs so that it could breathe on its own without a ventilator. So later in pregnancy, we'll do the amniocentesis and we can determine how mature the baby's lungs are from an assessment of that. One of the assessments that we can do is an LS ratio. This is a less of things thin sphygmomyelin ratio. Okay, and usually we would expect the ratio to be greater than two to one if the baby's lungs are mature and it's going to be able to breathe on its own. Another thing we can check for are creatinine levels. We can determine if the creatinine levels are of a certain amount that the baby's lungs are mature and it's safe for us to deliver the baby. The next major test of well-being would be chorionic villi sampling. Now, with chorionic villi sampling, it's recommended only for those women who are at very high risk for giving birth to a baby with a diagnosable genetic anomaly. So this may be a mother who has two children with cystic fibrosis already. She knows that she um, is carrying the genes. That's something that we can diagnose. Uh, there are a number of other illnesses that we can test for. But there's no point in doing chorionic villi sampling unless we are planning on doing a diagnosis. 
and there are risks to it, so we don't want to do it unless we feel that we can actually get some good information out of it. Now with chorionic villi sampling, the procedure is to aspirate a sample of chorionic villi. It's usually done at 10 to 12 weeks gestation, so it's being done earlier than we could do in amniocentesis. They actually go in with a needle and aspirate some of the chorionic villi. Now remember the chorionic villi are the portions that are going to implant and become the placenta. So you're actually taking some of those cells away. Um, now, women can get the result of this in 24 to 48 hours versus waiting two to three weeks with an amnio. This is going to allow those women who have a fetus that has a severe genetic problem to make a determination, do they want to terminate the pregnancy or carry it to term? And for some women, that is a very um, difficult question, but it's their decision to make. Um, so it's, it's a good test for women who know that they could have an infant with a very severe anomaly or genetic disorder, I should say. What are the risks? Well, the risks are that you actually have a slightly increased potential for having a lost pregnancy. In other words, there's a slightly increased level that the woman will have a spontaneous abortion. It has also been associated with limb reduction defects. Now, this could be that when you are aspirating some of that fluid at 10 to 12 weeks, not fluid, but the chorionic villi, that in fact you aspirate some cells that are going to eventually specialize as limbs, and therefore, you know, you disrupt their development. Uh, they are also at an increased risk of RH sensitization because there's a much greater likelihood that some bleeding is going to take place and that there may be blood mixing between the mother and the developing fetus. The next item of fetal assessment is our non-stress tests, or NSTs. These are done very, very frequently, and some women will have two, three, or maybe even four done during their pregnancy. They're very non-invasive and safe. They are done late in pregnancy. We are doing non-stress tests to assess fetal well-being. Non-stress tests evaluates the, the ability of the fetal heart to accelerate in association with fetal movement, and that's a good thing. Okay. With a non-stress test, an increase in fetal heart rate with movement is going to indicate an adequate oxygenation of the fetus. It's going to indicate that the baby has a healthy neural pathway from the fetal central nervous system to the heart in response to stimuli. <coughs> If the fetal heart rate does not increase with fetal movement, then you need to ask the question, is there hypoxemia or acidosis in the developing fetus? Okay. NST procedure. Now the procedure to do an NST really isn't too difficult. The woman needs to be um, placed on uh, a fetal monitor and we place external fetal and uterine monitors on the woman's abdomen. And uh, when these monitors are placed on, we are going to have a record made uh, of the fetal heart rate, and it's going to show off on graph paper. And we're also going to have a record made of when fetal movement occurs. <coughs> now, interpretation of the non-stress test. We're going to see the baby's heart rate, and then we are going to see uh, where fetal movement occurred. And when we interpret the non-stress test, we want this test to be what we call reactive. And a reactive non-stress test um, is when you have two or more fetal heart rate accelerations of at least 15 beats per minute lasting at least 15 seconds in a 20-minute interval. This is really good. For NSTs, we don't say positive. We say reactive, and it's important that you know that terminology. Now, another interpretation that we could see is non-reactive. And a non-reactive non-stress test doesn't meet the reactive criteria. Lastly, we might have an equivocal non-stress test. And what we find here is conflicting or difficult to determine data. Maybe we have 
three fetal movements, and for two of them, we see accelerations within a 20-minute period, but for the third, we don't. Well, two out of three isn't good enough to say it's reactive. It's not bad enough to say it's non-reactive, so we say it's equivocal. And we'll probably have the woman come back in in a day or so, or maybe we'll turn off the machine and redo it in a few hours to see if we can either get a reactive or non-reactive response. Now, if a woman has a non-reactive response, then um, we'll probably have her come back in a few days and have it repeated. Um, now, with the non-stress test, we really haven't discussed why are we doing this? Who has non-stress tests? Well, non-stress tests are done later in pregnancy, and they're done with anybody who has a condition that may compromise the fetus. In other words, uh, anyone who has uh, a condition that may decrease utero placental sufficiency or cause decreased oxygen to be and nutrients to be going being carried over to the fetus. Examples of this might be diabetes. We know during diabetes that the vascular system is profoundly effective. Well, if your vascular system isn't up to par, the baby may be becoming hypoxic. Another reason we might do it is if the mother has pregnancy-induced hypertension. Again, there may not be as good of circulation, therefore the baby may be under stress. And we would like to know that. So if the baby is under stress for a non-stress test, we will see a non-reactive non-stress test. And we will either do another one or we will move on to the next um, type of test we can do, which is a contraction stress test. A contraction stress test is indicated if the NST findings are non-reactive. A contraction st stress test involves recording of the responses of the fetal heart rate to stress. The stress in an, a contraction stress test is the contractions. Remember that as the uterus contracts, it squeezes off all of the blood vessels so there is decreased blood and oxygen, or I should say oxygen ch exchange across the placenta to the fetus. So during contractions, all fetuses are getting less oxygen. If the baby is stressed, that decreased oxygen is going to show up. Okay, and what we'll see are late decelerations. So that's what we're hoping not to see. We'd like to see the baby responding just fine to contractions. Now, what's the procedure for a contraction uh, stress test? Well, the first way we could do it is we could have the mother self-stimulate her breasts, and because when you stimulate the breasts, the pituitary releases oxytocin, and that causes the uterus to contract. Another way we can do it is by doing an oxytocin challenge test. Okay, CST interpretation. Now, as we said, we're going to stimulate contractions in the mother to see the type of stress and how the baby responds to the stress of the contractions. Now, the first interpretation we can have is negative, which is normal. And with this, we will see no late decelerations when we have at least three contractions of at least 40 seconds duration in a 10-minute period. If the contraction stress test is positive, it means that we have 50% or more of the contractions within uh, the 10 minute period are accompanied by a late deceleration. And we can have an equivocal finding, and that means that less than 50% of the contractions are associated with late decelerations, or the uterus was hyperstimulated. Now, hyperstimulated means that we wound up stimulating the woman's uterus too much and the contractions are lasting longer than 90 seconds. A contraction lasting longer than 90 seconds will stress even a baby who's doing well. Okay. The next thing we're going to talk about is the biophysical profile. Now with a biophysical profile, five different parameters are evaluated, so it is much more accurate than a non-stress test or a contraction stress test. With a biophysical profile, we're going to look at the fetal heart rate reactivity. We look at that by doing a non-stress test. Then, on uh, an ultrasound, we are going to watch for fetal breathing movements. 
and gross fetal movements. At the same time on the ultrasound, we can see what kind of tone does the fetus have. Is the fetus well flexed, which would be a good tone, we would want to see that, or does it appear to sort of be limp within the uterus? Next, we're going to actually, on the ultrasound, do a calculation and measure the amount of amniotic fluid that is present. And they do that by measuring the size of different pockets of fluid that they can see, and then they plug it into a formula and change that into milliliters of fluid. Now, leaving that, sometimes we want to evaluate fetal maturity, and we've already talked about this to a certain extent, uh, and we would want to know is the fetus mature or not if we have a condition in the mother or a condition in the baby that would tell us that maybe it's a good time to deliver this baby. Maybe this baby would do better on the outside. But once again, we want to know is this baby going to be able to breathe by themselves or is it going to need to be on a ventilator? Most of the time, if the baby ha has not developed to the point where it can breathe on its own, we would like to wait a few days or a week in hopes that the baby's lungs will mature. If we want to deliver a baby and the baby's lungs aren't mature yet, it hasn't reached that point, we can also give the mother uh, steroids in the form of betamethasone, for an example, and that will help hasten the baby's lungs to mature. In other words, it'll hurry them up a bit, and hopefully in a few days we'll be able to deliver. The first major test for evaluation of fetal lung maturity is um, testing the amniotic fluid for the lecithin sphygmomyelin ratio. And remember that we want an LS ratio of greater than 2 to 1 in order to have lung maturity. Okay, Another test for fetal maturity, and we're talking about fetal lung maturity, are the creatinine levels in the amniotic fluid. The creatinine levels, if they're 2 milligrams per deciliter uh, or more, that's associated with a pregnancy of at least 37 weeks or more. Now at 37 weeks, most fetuses will have mature lungs. So we could say that yes, if we delivered this woman now, her baby would be able to breathe on its own without assisted ventilation. Another test we can do is the shake test. And with this, uh, we take some amniotic fluid and we add a chemical to it. And if we see a ring of bubbles in the test tube, then that is positive for fetal lung maturity. That's sort of a quick and simple way of doing it. 